Welcome to Cisco Tech Beat, the podcast that explores the people and stories behind what inspires the newest innovation. I'm your host, AB, and fresh off the heels of RSA 2023, one of the biggest and most important security conferences in the world, I am welcoming Lorene Grenier, Director of Security Architecture at Cisco Talos, and someone I've wanted to have on the show for quite some time. Lorene has spent her career as an offensive security lead, analyzing state-sponsored actor trends, writing detection to block those threat actors, and in general, educating users and administrators on how to deploy the most robust security solutions. So without further ado, Loreen, welcome to TechBeat. Hey, B, how you doing? I am good. I am good. We have so much to talk about, and I'm going to kick off with this. So you're now a director at Cisco Talos, but you actually worked for that company or that division before it even had that name and became what it is today. So how did you get started with the group that would eventually become Cisco Talos? And how did the work you focused on then evolve into the role you have now? So I started with the Sourcefire VRT under Matt Wachinski, who is currently the head of Talos. I think that was in 2006. And there were three other employees, maybe four other employees on the team when I joined it. One of those four are still around in Talos. I actually worked with the majority of the director team at Sourcefire VRT when they were on my team, uh, the analyst team. Right. Uh, so that's kind of the equivalent of Alan Zidwemba's team nowadays in Talos. So the, the content creation, mm. things like that. During that time, my job was primarily to deal with Microsoft Tuesday. So back in the day, Microsoft did not give out information to a lot of companies. They give out information to just the really big companies. And all of the smaller companies had to do it themselves. Right. So, you know, Microsoft Tuesday would, would come around and it's about 1, 1 p.m. on the East Coast, 10 a.m. on the West Coast. And we would just race. You know, they'd come out with 15 patches. Nine of them would be kind of high intensity, things that we'd have to actually uh, write rules for. And so I would write an exploit for each one of those and dump it in Metasploit. So starting at 1 p.m., I would just write exploits until they were all written. And then uh, the analyst team would run through them and write the detection for each of those exploits. And we'd push it out and uh, we would have it out before we left the office. So all <laughs> in less than 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty intense. I mean, how did you even get into doing that in the first place? Um, so I started in high school, I worked on OpenBSD for a little while and, and kind of a light capacity to, to understand that sort of stuff. But I was interested in like weird architectures and hardware and stuff like that. And, um, that's kind of the stuff you need to know to start exploit development is really understanding the facilities, the hardware provides you and how software interacts with that hardware at like that that core level, because that's kind of the place that your fight exists in. So I got into it that way. Wow, that's nice. And then you just kept, kept it going. And and I, you know, sort of to segue to this other thing that I know that we've talked about before, you consider yourself an offensive security lead. And so what does that mean in comparison to other roles within the security landscape? What does an offensive security lead do? I would say I consider myself an offensive security lead. I, my background is entirely in offense. So, you know, at uh, Sourcefire VRT, I was writing exploits. I ran the analyst team and, you know, we put out all the detection, but that was not my wheelhouse. My wheelhouse was exploit creation. Uh, and, you know, in the time between Talos and the VRT, I worked uh, at a couple of contractors writing exploits. What does it mean to me? to be on offense. What it means is that all of the defensive suggestions that I make are predicated on things that I have experienced as an attacker and things that I think would have given me a hard time. If I don't think it's going to give, would have given me a hard time, then I'm not particularly interested in it as a defense because if I can walk around it, other people can walk around it and that's all there is to it. That's right. And so do you still have that same kind of approach even within Cisco Talos? I mean, is that really a necessary ingredient to, to do the work that you and your team does? You know, a lot of companies don't think so, but I, I think so, and I think Cisco thinks so. Um, if you don't understand what your attacker is going to bring to the table at any given moment, 
then your defense is going to be inadequate, basically, right? Like, if you don't, if you don't know what they're going to come with, if you got swords and shields, you've been you've been hammering swords and shields out for years and years and years, and they come with rifles, you're going to be in trouble, right? So you had better be <laughs> studying the rifles as they're building them. And that means building them yourself. If you can build rifles that beat your shields, then you understand what they're going to build, what you will see, right? Yeah. And it must be pretty exciting now because when you think about how everything is connected and how technology just keeps advancing so quickly, there must be uh, even more and more powerful rifles and, and weapons that are very accessible to people who want to create trouble for companies or for individuals, right? It's very interesting, actually. What I've seen is like a stratification in rifle building, right? Like there are extremely high-end state-sponsored actor rifles. There are uh, low-end state-sponsored rifle uh, actor rifles. There are ransomware, like financially motivated actors that use any means necessary, really, right? But, so, so it runs the gamut from extremely sophisticated technical attacks to just barely clearing the hurdle technical attacks to calling somebody on the phone and tricking them, which is the oldest trick in the book. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, I think I was reading that sometimes people don't even use tech uh, to basically infiltrate industry and infiltrate someone's personal data, right? I mean, it's as simple as just having a conversation. That, that is that as prevalent as it as people are making it out to be? I think it's more prevalent. I think for the vast majority of financially motivated actors, their, you know, their initial ingress into your network is your people, right? It's it is right. really inexpensive to call 100 people on the phone and three people will will be fooled. And that's not a function of people's education or or people's level or people's understanding or any of that, it is merely a function of people's stress level. And if you can push someone's stress level over a threshold, then all they want to do is get things out of their face, right? They cannot engage with it fully because there's just too many things to engage with. So that, that is, you know, a problem that we are going to face until we figure out how to lower people's stress thresholds. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Low, lowering stress is important, people, for for everybody, for every for all kinds of reasons. Uh, this is why I love talking to you too, because every time we talk, I'm like, you, I keep having more questions, so I, I apologize. Uh, but you mentioned the financial aspect of it. Obviously, there are people who want to just get paid. I mean, I don't know if there is an actual percentage, but like, is it the majority of threat uh, attacks based on financial want, or is it kind of a mix of different things that you just have to figure out what it is they're looking for? Um. I think primarily now, by the numbers, it'll be uh, financially motivated, right? So you've got financial motivation, political motivation by a non-state actor, and then uh, kind of the actual warfare and espionage level of state actor, right? Uh, but right. you know, all ransomware, all extortion, most of the things you read about in the news are going to be financially motivated, right? Even North Korea is going to be financially motivated to hack you, right? That's what they're they're going for now. Absolutely, that's pretty scary. But uh, I, that's why we have divisions like Cisco Talos and and others trying to make sure that these people don't uh, don't succeed with their hacks and with their attacks. I want to talk about attacks a little bit more in a, in a different way. Years ago, I read a book called One Second After, which which I really loved. It was basically about a foreign state getting a hold of a, a nuclear weapon, but instead of detonating it in the traditional way, they did it in the atmosphere to create an electromagnetic pulse, and it knocked out a good portion of the region and the states that was hit. And basically, everything went back to the Dark Ages. I mean, people were fighting for survival. Every little thing caused chaos, and, and, and it was kind of a scary book, but based on potentially real events. Nowadays, it seems like with hacking and computers and everything being connected, you don't actually need a physical explosive to do the same kind of damage. I mean, th how real is that threat where someone can literally uh, write code and use a computer or a network and cause severe infrastructure meltdown? Should ask Osama bin Laden, <laughs> right? <laughs> they turned off the lights, brought in the helicopters and turned the lights back on afterwards, right? Um, mm. That was the plan uh, and it went down quite well. Nobody knew what was going on until after it was done or until the helicopter crashed. But, but uh, our infrastructure is probably, uh, based on my view, much more vulnerable than our companies are. And I think the reason for that is because our companies have, knock on wood, been hardened by the financially motivated actors, 
right? Every time ransomware gets in, somebody's like, oh, shoot, we got to solve this problem. They're getting a little bit harder to hack. There is no financial motivation for infrastructure destruction. And so they have been blissfully left alone uh, now that kind of worms aren't prevalent, right? Like that's where they saw their biggest problem is when worms were running around, it would just randomly get into infrastructure. Um, yeah. But that's generally no longer the case, right? You're not seeing a ton of remote exploits anymore, exploits that are coming from one computer through a network port and owning another computer in one shot. It's, it's kind of right. more rare. Um so yeah, I mean, you saw in the news just recently people knocking out entire towns for like a week and a half with a shotgun, right? Like you shoot the transformer and like, what are we going to do about it? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely worried about the state of our infrastructure. I think, um, you know, when you're a uh, civvy and you go to build a bridge, you've had a test. Your design is validated by a third party. And then somebody else builds the bridge and then the bridge is validated by another third party. And if the bridge falls over and everybody dies, that's your fault and you're in trouble. That is not the case with software, but software runs everything, right? Software is our new infrastructure and we do not have the same mindset around software that we do around other infrastructure yet. It's kind of the wild west of, of infrastructure right now. I think we, we really need to change the way that we think about software. It's not just a thing that you can knock out and not care about. It's the thing that controls the power grid and the thing that controls the bridges, right? We got to treat it that way or else we're in trouble. So it's almost like we need to adopt software practices and protocol within regulatory practices when it comes to building and, you know, infrastructure, bridges, whatever. Yeah, that absolutely. really should be a, as, as much of a part. Yeah. In my view, if, if you're not writing a phone app, then you need to be, you know, scrutinized at that level. Yeah, totally makes sense. Um, let us switch gears just a little bit. As you, of course, know, we recently released the Cybersecurity Readiness Index. And for anybody out there who doesn't know what that is, essentially it was a global study that measured how resilient companies are against cybersecurity attacks on their networks, devices, data, you name it. And it's actually a really, really cool study that you can find on, on Cisco.com. But it does show that there are still a lot of organizations out there that are just not prepared. They don't have, you know, what we call a mature state of of protection or resilience when it comes to, you know, fending off cyber attacks. So is it just, what are the reasons they're not ready? Is it cost? Is it knowledge? Why don't these companies have preparedness? In the immortal words of 1980s George Harrison, it's going to take money, a whole lot of spending money. <laughs> Right. There, there's not a, lot of, yep. not a lot of incentive to spend a whole lot of spending money if you haven't been punched in the face yet, right? That's um, right. So, you know, for a lot of these companies that just happen to luck out so far, they're only going to get so far that lucky. And then eventually they're going to be the low hanging fruit, right? Well, they'll get plucked and eaten and then they'll have to deal with it. While I would prefer to see them deal with it first, you know, that's their prerogative, I guess. <laughs> Sure. Oh, absolutely. And it, it makes me think too, and I don't know if this is connected, so so definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember when I was talking to G2 on a podcast several months ago, we were talking br very briefly about security poverty line and you know this whole idea that companies, uh, and this tends to affect smaller companies, but sometimes big companies, if they're not prepared from a you know secure standpoint, whether it's access or uh, knowledge, obviously there's some financial element to that too, then because they're connected on the network and everything is interconnected, really the whole network is as weak as its weakest link, right? So does this affect the security of bigger companies too, for these companies that are not deciding to pay money to get their security up to par? Yes, absolutely. You can see that in um, the signing system that we have now, where larger companies will subcontract out their driver signing to a smaller company. And then the smaller company gets popped and now suddenly a whole bunch of malware is signed, right? Right. That's happened multiple times. The weird thing is, I think, the smaller your company is, the easier it is for you to secure it, right? You can define really well the parameters of your work and just lock the network on down to that. With the bigger the company is, the more complicated the types of workflow are. And so you can't have a single overarching security posture for every group. 
uh, but for a really small focus company, you can, right? It's totally possible. And that's, that's not buying a bunch of expensive products that's setting up your network properly and, you know, just the very basics of IT. Yeah. You know, we work for a huge company and you can imagine the, the number of uh, access points for people depending on their level or their grade or, you know, their need to know basis. <laughs> Different countries, contractors, separate groups that need like information compartmentalization, all that stuff exists, you know, in a, in a big company, but in a small company, they don't have that. You know, you got 15 to 100 people, they're all on one network, they all got the same computer, very easy to define what they're all going to do. Absolutely. All right, we're going to shift gears completely once again. And for anybody who is listening now, when we started the call, Lorene had her guitar in her lap. And we both know from a previous conversation that we're both musicians. So I want to talk to you about music. And, and of course, I want to talk to you about other stuff in your room there, because there's some really cool stuff in the background. But let's talk <laughs> music first, because yeah. that's the big passion. So Obviously, you're a guitarist. Talk to me about that. How or when did you start playing guitar? And what are you listening to now to keep motivating you to, to get better on the axe? So I started playing when I was like 12 or 13. Uh, and I played like an idiot. And I listened to bad music. <laughs> uh, I listened to a lot of good music. But I also listened to a bunch of 90s bad music, right? And um, the way I played the guitar is I learned how to play songs. And I had no understanding of how they're put together or really any serious musicianship whatsoever. And I kind of did that on and off for a long time. Uh, you know, and I got like technically all right, but I still had no understanding what I couldn't move a song to a different key. I couldn't transcribe the song by ear. Uh, and then at the beginning of the pandemic, I uh, seriously hurt my back and it kind of like knocked out every single hobby that I had. And so I was just sitting on the couch or like in a zero G chair getting bad habits, right? Like just getting sucked into YouTube. <laughs> I was like, this is not going to fly. I have all these guitars. I'm just going to get really serious about this one thing because I know I can do this till I die and never get to the end of it. Right. And, and so I did a lot more singing and playing at first. And then from there, like really understanding rhythm, I moved into kind of uh, like a more serious study of the instrument, like forcing myself to learn all of my arpeggios and how everything fits together and all the little tricks. And I think the big thing was understanding how modes work really unlocked all of music for me before that. I know a lot of people, this is not a thing that they need, but for my brain, <laughs> as soon as I learned modes, I was like, oh, okay, I got this now. <laughs> And yeah. From there, it was just shoving stuff into my brain, you know? <laughs> I love that. Well, I mean, listen, we all learn totally differently. I mean, there, there's software out there uh, for recording music. Some people love X, Y, or Z, and the others are like, I don't even understand how this format works. This doesn't speak to me. It doesn't logically make sense to me. So yeah. it totally makes sense that, you know, learning music uh, in general is a very specific and a very personal journey. Like anything else you're learning, you have to go with whatever speaks to you and whatever you understand easily. Yeah. So very cool. The guitar that you had when I saw you before, what, what what did you have? What was that? I couldn't really see what it was. Was it was it a Strat? Yeah, it's a 1996 uh, American oh, wow, that. Strat that's uh, been oh. kind of ratted up a little bit since then. That is awesome. And this is that's the guitar that I played the most, but I did just get uh, a PRS that I am completely in love with. It's basically like the guitar I've wanted since I was a kid and could never find or afford right so that's what i'm playing the most of and this is this guy is kind of secondary i want to get a full setup and, and some other stuff fixed on him i will do that eventually i know once you once you go down the uh, the, the gear slash instrument rabbit hole um it's 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 you know it's a never-ending thing but when you find that one that one piece or that one instrument that you're just you've been yearning to get and you finally get it oh it's just it's so inspiring to play it right Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can just sit down for like five hours with that thing and just not is, tell somebody pesters me. I'll just sit there. I'm perfectly happy. <laughs> I love that. Hey, talk to me a little bit just about some of the stuff behind you. I mean, I, I'm seeing like uh, old video games, consoles. What, what, what's, is that just a hobby or the things that you've had and you just didn't know where to store them? Um, so I actually I really like uh, old hardware. Okay. So when I was uh, younger, the machine that I used to use uh, in high school and college was a Spark Station 2, like a little, a little mm. Sun pizza box. 
because I like interesting, weird architectures. And every video game system that's old, every old one, is basically a custom architecture, right? It's, it's a whole new architecture, every system. The main processor might be the same, but, you know, the graphics processor is different, and the bus is different, and the way you interact with memory is different. You know, I go through and fix old game systems and mess with them as, like, uh, primitive architectures, basically. Um, right. I'm like a, an assembly junkie. I like playing assembly games, and those old systems are kind of like haiku, right? Like, the, the restriction breeds creativity. So... I'm, I'm way more into the older stuff than like a new game systems, just a computer in a box. So I don't care really. You can do anything on the thing. Right. But those guys are, are, uh, are, are kind of unique. Each one's really unique. You know, it's funny. A lot of my friends who do cybersecurity or who are programmers, a lot of them just happen to also be gaming enthusiasts. Not that they're the biggest gamers. Some are pretty big. Others are, you know, just, they do it as a hobby, but it's interesting because I've had this, uh, talk with people on my show before about getting into security and getting into cybersecurity and and w- you know coming from a background of tech and the misconception that you have to be a programmer and a tech whiz to be a cybersecurity expert or specialist. I just want to get your thoughts on that. I mean, I mean, I feel like this is a really exciting field that does not necessarily require you to have that background. And so for anyone out there who's aspiring to do this, what would you say in terms of words of encouragement to kind of get their feet wet? Let's go at this from a couple of different angles. So first, um, if you are not a programmer and you don't want to be a programmer, there are plenty of things that you can do, right? One of the main injunctions for security is organization, like the organization of your knowledge about your network. The black hat mantra is whoever knows the network best owns the network, right? So you can be an extremely effective security practitioner as a a T crossing, I dotting IT person, right? That is... That's like the very bottom line. That's, that is the most necessary and first thing that you need to be able to do to protect the network. And there's plenty of space there for non-programmers. If you want to do what I do, which is very specific, exploit development, then you should learn assembly. And the way that I teach people is I teach them basic native data structures and algorithms. So you'll like write a linked list, learn to write a linked list, you'll compile the linked list, you will put it in a disassembler and a debugger, and then you will reverse engineer your own code. So now you know what that data structure and algorithm looks like in assembly. And then you go do the next one. And you keep doing that until you have these patterns in your head for what different necessary algorithms look like in assembly. And then you can reverse engineer very quickly. It's like reading a book. You've learned how to read words now instead of just letters. And I would say, do not be intimidated by assembly. Assembly is actually the simplest programming language you can learn. Every line does exactly one thing and only one thing, and it's extremely simple. And the complicated part of assembly is keeping a long list of very simple operations in your head. But, you know, through reversing, you can learn to do that. And it's not hard. Well, I mean, it is hard. It's not complicated. How about that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's like music, right? It's exactly like music. There's only seven notes in your key, right? You can do all this stuff with seven notes in your key. You can do a lot of stuff with seven instructions. That's all you need, basically, for most of a program. So it's very much like that. Yes, that's perfect. I mean, that is a perfect place for us to wrap this conversation because we both love music so much. Um, Lorene, thank you so much for joining the conversation today. Thank you for your time. And I'm really glad we were able to get this done, especially after RSA, which just happened not that long ago. So I I appreciate you hopping on the show. Ah, Thanks very much, A.B. This is a wonderful conversation. I look forward to doing it again. Oh, yeah, for sure. Take care. Take it easy.